Three books. Three books. You know, books are made of words. Thursday this week, we attended a funeral service. And our cousin, Z2, were having a hard time dealing with the loss of their mother. Their father passed in October. And Lisa shared these words. Listen to them. The leaves are gone, and I can see your light through the woods, a mother's comfort close at hand. One day that light will not be yours, and it will break my broken heart again. You sense the texture and the color, the emotion, the feeling. There's more to words than just words. There's communicating so many different things. I have a book here. It has my name written on it. Jackie Nash. J-A-C-K-I-E, Nash. In my mother's handwriting, This book, this word right here is the first word I ever read. On this page, on this paper, in this book, I'm holding in my hand. Do you know what it is? Look! Sally's putting on her dad's overshoes. And on the next page, look, look. Oh, oh, oh. Because Dick was sprinkling the water. Oh, 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 look. Another chapter. Jane. Oh, Jane. Look, Jane, look, 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 oh, look. See, Jane? She's riding on her tricycle, and the dolly dropped down, but along came Spot and picked up the dolly and carried it up to her while she continued to speed on. See, 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 Jane, oh, see, Jane. Bring back memories? Books, words, Dick, look, Jane. Look, look, see, Dick, see, see, oh, see, Dick. Oh, see, Dick, oh, oh, funny, funny, Dick. Seventeen words in all in this entire book, repeated over and over in the way that a child would read and speak because this was how I learned to read this book. So this particular book, I don't know how long it had been around before I got my hands on it, but I figure it's about 66, 67 years old. Here's another book. It says early writings on it. This book is the second edition the first edition was published in 1851. And it refers to that and gives the preface from the 1851 first edition. But by popular demand, it was republished in 1882. There are many things in this book, too. This book has color, has texture, has meaning. And then I have another book. 
I keep this book protected because this book is falling apart. It's not that old. Our watchword, that which governs us, is from the book. And as we read the book, we're looking for the words, but we're not just looking for the words. We're looking for the shades of meaning, the colors, the nuances. If we only see letters black on white, we miss so much because the author meant more perhaps than just what the words said. But our watchword to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If they speak, they, anyone, if they speak, compare it to the law and to the testimony. Is that true of anyone? Compare it to the law and to the testimony. If they speak. What about if Ted Wilson speaks? You know Ted Wilson? To the law and to the testimony. Doug Batchelor, to the law and to the testimony. Walter Veith, to the law and to the testimony. Ellen White, to the law and to the testimony. Vance Farrell, to the law and to the testimony. Gary Rustad, you know who that is? Oh, the president of our conference, that's right. You see, it doesn't matter what my title is, where I sit, where my office is, or a lack of office. Everything must be compared to the law and to the testimony. And if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, given by inspiration of God, are profitable for doctrine. Who needs doctrine? It's profitable because I need to know truth. It's profitable for reproof. Who needs reproof? I need reproof. It's for me to read and receive reproof for correction. Who needs correction? I need correction. The word of God is written to each one of us in this world that we might receive doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in righteousness that the man and the woman may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Does that mean without flaw? Perfect. Without flaw? If I am totally without flaw, then it means that I know everything. Because if I don't know everything, then I can't conform to everything, can I? How about this definition of perfect? Full surrender. The child that has full surrender and reads, look, 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 is learning to look upon Jesus and to discover what is in early writings and what is in God's word. Full surrender. Do you know if I am living in full surrender, the Lord can grow me and grow me, and one day he may say, you're perfect in every sense of the word. And I'll say, really? I had no idea. Because it's not about me. It's about coming to know the author of the book. And of course, full surrender also means responding to what the word has to say. So, as you compare the Bible with the mind, which way does the arrow go? Which arrow? The arrow that comes from God's word to the mind. I try to picture this as I am speaking, as I'm explaining something, as I'm hearing a preacher preaching, where is this thought coming? Where does it originate? Is it coming from the word or is this my opinion? Maybe I've read something someplace else. Maybe somebody told me something else and I have come to believe it and I tell it and I might even say that I've done thorough research. Well, if I have, is that what you want to know? That I've done thorough research? If so, then who are you trusting? 
me. What you want to know is what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? That must our question be, for man-made theories will often mislead. What does the Bible say indeed? In the little book, Lift Him Up, page 125, take the Bible as your study book. All can understand it. Do you believe that? All can understand it? It might require some effort. It might require some time. Christ calls upon his people to believe and practice his word. Follow this one. To those who receive and assimilate this word, making it a part of every action, of every attribute of character, will grow strong in the strength of God. It will be seen that their faith is of heavenly origin. They will not wander into strange paths. And who are these things true for? Those who receive and assimilate this word. That doesn't just mean going to church, does it? That means more than just going to church. Their minds will not turn to a religion of sentimentalism and excitement. You know, some people get involved in things that are exciting. What makes it exciting? Because it's new. And you know what? I got something that you don't have. And if I've got something that you don't have, then I must be pretty good. And so I come up with this new exciting thing, that which is stimulating, that which draws attention. It says their minds will not turn to a religion of sentimentalism. Well, it's what my dad always said. It's what my dad always taught. It's what my mother always said. It's what grandpa always said. That's what I was taught growing up. Sentimental. It's good enough for papa. It's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. It's so good enough for me. It was and so on. What are we really saying? I don't need to learn anything new. I don't need to learn anything more because I got what my daddy had. I got what my grandpa had. Even if daddy did sing bass and mama sang tenor and all of us kids, we joined right in there. We need God's word in our minds, clearly understanding before angels and before men, they will stand as those who have strong consistent Christian characters. Every one of those words is there for a reason. Strong. Consistent. Christian characters. Weak. Inconsistent. Sort of Christian. Characters, it doesn't cut it. We need the strong. Do not advocate theories or tests that Christ has never mentioned and that have no foundation in the Bible. I'm not reading the Bible right now. I'm reading an inspiring and inspired statement. Do not advocate theories or tests. Tests? Well, you can't be of God if you don't teach this, that, or the other. Why? Because I got this text. My friend, do not advocate theories or tests that Christ has never mentioned and that have no foundation in the Bible. I know we've got some contractors, and I know that when we put foundations in, we don't put in light foundations, not if we want the building to stand. 
If we're going to find a truth, and it's going to be in God's word, it's going to be a, built on a foundation that has more than one reference to it. And if it's important, Jesus is going to be teaching it. And those are the things that we need to be majoring in. Do not advocate theories or tests that Christ has never mentioned and that have no foundation in the Bible. Advocate theories or tests. Don't do it. So I may find something that's curious and it may be of interest to me and I may share it with a friend. But I should not be pressing it. I should not be advocating it. And I should not be making it a test for other people or even for myself. We have grand, solemn truths for the people. It is written, is the test that must be brought home to every soul. Well, pastor, you're preaching to the choir. We're Seventh-day Adventists, and we all believe in the Bible. The Bible and the Bible only. We're Protestants. We're there. How much value are we placing on the Bible in our lives each day? It is written. How often does it is written come into my heart, come into my mind? How often do I think about the things of the world? How often am I preoccupied with what's going on under the Capitol Dome or at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? All of interest. We have grand, solemn truths for the people. And when I stand up here, I want to present grand, solemn truths for the people. I do not want the people to watch on the internet and see me hassling about some minor issue. Because we live in a time where the winds of strife are blowing and slipping through the fingers of those angels who are trying to hold back the winds of strife that are described in the scriptures. We are living in a time when there are grand and solemn truths which must be known and we must, in fact, ourselves know them. Do we look to the rabbi, to the church fathers? This is what this conference president, general conference president said. What is moving us? We have grand, solemn truths for the people, and they are found in God's book. This is the first book. And you know what the second book is? Nature. There's much that we can learn about God in nature. But the grand solemn truths that we have are not those things which are lifted up by learned men. They are those things which speak to us from God's word. And when I quote, I want to be able to quote God's word that has spoken to me. Here is pictured a vintage Bible, 1865. Thought it was pretty good. And here I've got this little book. I wish it was the first edition. But 1882, I believe it was. There's something about finding ancient words. Even if ancient words are recorded in new bindings, they are still vintage and still of great value. Here is a picture of a gloved hands holding Wycliffe's English Bible. Would you like to hold that Bible? When we visited Elmshaven and we went through the house where Ellen White lived, and no, she is not God, but she is a messenger of God. And the messages that she shares are messages for us. A lesser light pointing us to the greater light. And as this sister was telling us, this was Ellen White's bedroom. 
And this is the place where her bed was. And there was a replica bed there because Ellen White's bed was long gone, but vintage from the time. And she said, and at the foot of this bed, Jesus came and spoke to Ellen White. She woke. She'd gone to bed early that evening, had not been feeling well, 6 p.m. It was dark now. It was in the night. Jesus had come to speak. The nurses up at the St. Helena Hospital were able to look down and see the azure light coming from the window of Ellen White. Why do I say this? Because it's real. Because God is real. And Jesus is real. And the Holy Spirit is real. And when Jesus came and stood at the foot of that bed and spoke to her, well, it touched me. And when we left that room and we were down to the room where she was writing, and then we scattered, the tour was over. I went back to that room. And I knelt down beside that bed. And it was not, uh, not a pilgrimage, but it was a moment. And I was able to say, Lord, Jesus, you've been in this room before. Please be in this room right now. Because I want to know what you want me to know. And here's what I want to know today. I want this to be 2023, the year of the Bible. Did you know that this year is declared the year of the Bible? You know who declared it? I just did. Did you hear me? So I declared this the year of the Bible, and I wanted to declare it in January, but it didn't work out. 2023, the year of the Bible. If this is the year of the Bible, then what's different? Then in each of our homes, each, you see that word? In each of our homes, let me rephrase it, in all of our homes, homes, or could I say in all of our, each of our homes, because each is very specific and all is very inclusive. So in all of our homes, in 2023, may we vow not to talk about the Bible. Don't talk about the Bible. But Read and study the Bible. Don't just say what it says. Read what it says. Don't just read what it says. Study what it says. And passionately pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to those who passionately seek the Holy Spirit. Spend time Asking throughout the day, constantly consisting, men of God, men of God, men, men of God. I would like to ask the men of God to stand. Men of God, to just stand right here, right now, right where you are. Men of God, God who count themselves men of God. Not the ladies. Your turn will come. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't clear because I always include the women when I say men of God, don't I? Men of God. I want to challenge you today, men of God. Will you lead in the reading of God's word? In 2023, will you lead in the reading of God's word in 2023? Lead in the reading of God's word in 2023. Women of God. <laughs> you got a place too. Women of God on your feet if you can. Put the Bible in a prominent place in your home so the men of God will be tripped. Don't put it on the floor, but put it in a place that will be observable so that there is time to read in that book. Men of God, read the word of God in 2023. Women of God, put the Bible in a place so the men of God will see it if they don't see it already. Will you accept that challenge? 
Make 2023 the year of the Bible. Not the year of the Bible on the shelf, but the year of the Bible in the home. Where we read the Bible and we spend time considering the Bible. What I would like to suggest is that we go back to basics. Back to basics. Get the foundation. Get those words. Speak those words in the home. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Now, let me just talk a little bit about that. It was a long time ago. You know, they had these little trophies. You could get them. They were about this high. About this high. Maybe that's an inch. Maybe two inches. I don't know. But you'd get these little trophies. And I can remember world's best. Whatever it was. World's best, world's best lover, world's best whatever. And my wife found one that said something about a jogger. And she gave that little trophy to her brother. And she was happy to give that trophy to her brother. And it said something about joggers running in our family. Joggers run in our family. And you know what his response was? He said, I'm not a jogger. I'm a runner. What's the difference? Well, joggers jog and runners run. That's the difference. Joggers jog and runners run. I'm not a Bible reader. I'm a student of the Bible. Men of God. Women of God. I'm not a Bible reader. You know a Bible reader reads, re reads words? And after reading the words, what is known, what is understood? But the student says, why is that word there? What is that word saying to me? What do these three words in a row mean? How do they speak to me? What is the message of these words? I would like to make this the year, will you declare it with me, the year of the Bible in our homes. Not the year of the cell phone unless it's used to read the Bible. Not the year of YouTube or the game but the year of the Bible. Now, my brother-in-law was a runner, and it dawned on him he was spending more time running than he was reading the Bible, and he decided he was going to give equal time to the Bible. So that mean, meant he either needed to cut the time running or up the time reading. He upped the time reading. And just because we're reading and checking it off, saying I spent time reading, I want to be a student of the Bible. None but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Fortified. The mind. Not a casual reading, not a casual passing through. Yes, I read my Sabbath school lesson. But none but those who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Truths. Grand, solemn truths. Not Bible trivia. Not information that I can prove I am right, but grand, solemn truths. You know, as you start studying the Bible, things may look one way. You see that fence there? All right, I'm going to be a fence post, all right? I'm going to be a fence post, and I'm going to stand right here, and I'm going to ask Keith to stand right in the middle of the back, and he's going to be a fence post, okay? So can you tell me, where does the fence run? Where does the fence run, huh? Where does it run? You sure? 
Judy, would you come stand over here, please? You'll be a fence post. Thank you. And I've asked Bo if he'd be a fence post over there. Okay, so now where does the fence run? Changed direction, didn't it? It may still include this truth, but it also includes this truth and this truth. You see, our first discovery may be great, but until we have fully studied it through, we're probably going to be wrong. Thank you. You may have a seat. So, I can tell you, and I've mentioned it before, when I was preaching on the love of God and the reason that God is to be worshipped, I discovered a question came to my mind. It said, why does God need to see blood before he can forgive sins? Does he need to see blood? I mean, is that what he needs to see his son on the cross before he can say, well, grudgingly, I will become willing to forgive him or him or her? And I realized I had some studying to do because somewhere in my mind I had the idea that the father needed to have his anger assuaged before he could forgive sin. And then I said, Lord, help me. And the text popped into my mind. The text popped into my mind. God is love. So I said, obviously not, because the scripture says God is love. And I left the pulpit saying, you got a lot of studying to do. And for the next couple of months, I spent four to six hours a day reading the Bible. I took a concordance and I looked up the word blood. And every time the word blood appeared, I studied that verse the whole chapter, the chapter before, the chapter after. Then I wrote a summary stating, statement, what the word blood, how it was used in that passage. And I continued that process through the entire scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And you know, when I got done and I spoke to people, they said, Where, who taught you this? Where did you learn that? What school of thinking is this? And I said, I don't know. I just know it's what the Bible says. And I don't tell you what the Bible says about the blood. I tell you to go read it for yourself. Because when we invest time in God's word, we will get the message out of his word that he has for us. And then the fence posts will line up until we have clearly in mind what the author was trying to say. Those who are engaged in proclaiming the third angel's message are searching the scriptures upon the same plan that Father Miller adopted in the little book entitled Views of the Prophecies and Prophetic Chronology. Father Miller gives the following simple but intelligent and important rules for Bible study and interpretation. Review and Herald, November 25, 1884. Would you like to know what those are? Would you like to know those five rules? Well, next Sabbath, after fellowship dinner, I will give you a copy of those rules and some other statements. And we will spend an hour studying the Bible. Father Miller had a plan of studying the Scripture. But the important lesson that I want to share with you is a skill to discovering truth in God's Word. I want to encourage you to be there. It'll just be one hour. I always try to hold to one hour so that you can feel like you can come again. And between now and then, our closing hymn, number 309, All to Jesus I Surrender. <laughs> 